we are at that time of year where society depicts as the most wonderful time of the year, as the song says. A time of joy, a time of memories, a time of family get-togethers. But society has really turned Christmas to Christless. It is about materialism and partying. And face it, we all experience it. Got to get the Christmas cards out. Got to get these gifts bought. And you make the cookies. Got to make the meal. And all this rush, 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 rush around the Christmas season. And suddenly the Christmas day is gone and passed. And two weeks later, you get a call. Aunt Gertrude's calling. Did you send her the card? No, no. So, sorry, Aunt Gertrude. No, 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 no. It's no reflection of, of what we feel. We love you so much. Sorry we didn't send the Christmas card to you. It wasn't, we, we didn't do it on purpose. Sorry, sorry. And then after an hour and a half, you finally hang up, and the Christmas season is finally officially over. In this rush, they have turned Christmas, to this Christmas season, statistically into one of the most depressing times of the year. Because Jesus is no longer the reason for the season. So if you would, I'd like today to make a comparison, a few comparisons on why Jesus is greater than Santa. And I'll just put Santa in quotation marks for the protection of some years. But first, Santa comes once a year. But Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Santa comes and is gone. And before you know it, he's not around for the rest of the year. But Jesus is available 24-7, 365 days of the year. Every hour, every second, he is available. Number two, Santa lives at the North Pole. And he has never once invited me to his house. But the scripture says... In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Thank you, Jesus. Sant number three. Santa's belly shakes like a bowl of jelly. But the scripture says that Jesus can cause rivers of living water to flow out of our bellies. Santa is to bring joy, but Jesus not only brings joy unspeakable, but he gives us righteousness, peace, and joy. Santa can travel around the world in a single night. But the psalmist said in Psalms 139, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Jesus is omnipresent. He doesn't have to travel by a sleigh because he's already there. When he's in China, he's in Chicago. When he's in London, he's in Bolivia. Santa can't do that. San number six. Santa knows, according to songs, if you've been bad or good, and so does Jesus. But he also knows my going-ins and my goings-outs. And he cares so much about me that he even knows how many hairs that are on top of my head. 
He knows my strengths. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my successes. He knows my failures. He knows my faults, and he still loves me. He knows more than my wants. He knows what I have need of, and he provides it. He is truly all-knowing, and I can't say the same for the big fat man in the red suit. Number seven, my God is all-powerful. He just spoke, and all the universes, all the planets, the stars, the suns, the galaxies, everything was created in the instant. Santa can't do that. Number eight, I have not heard of one instant where Santa healed even one person. But with Jesus' stripes, we were and are healed. The Bible has hundreds of stories of people being healed, and there's people being healed in this church. Number eight, nine. Santa can't heal your broken heart, but Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. In fact, he came that we have, might have life and that we would have it more abundantly. And number 10, Santa gives gifts that in two weeks are run down, broken, or lost somewhere. But Jesus gave his life. It won't be the man in the red suit. Spiritually speaking, when I stand before my cross, condemned to death because of my sin, it wasn't his hand that said, sorry, my son, I will take your place. You stay right here. And Jesus climbed on the cross. That's why Jesus is greater than Santa. In conclusion, Santa... When Santa is the reason for this season, you have disappointment, heartache. You have one of the most depressing times of year and the highest suicide rates. But when Jesus is the reason for this season, he can take away every heartache, every addiction, every pain, every bit of loneliness, anger, depression. In exchange, Jesus gives us a second chance. He gives deliverance, a new life. Hope, peace, joy, strength, healing, provision, protection, victory, and the list goes on. Jesus just needs to be the reason for the season every day of our lives. And if you've been bad... He won't bring you anything. (laughs) But Jesus loved me when I was bad. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) My son was little. He said the old frog. (laughs) This is the season to worship Jesus. Every day is the day to worship Jesus. And when you worship him, you're not doing anything bad. You're getting in line for a blessing. He inhabits the praises of his people. And when we praise him, he starts looking to see what he can send down and give to us. He is a giver of gifts. For a little while, with the help of the Lord, I want to preach to you today from Matthew 24, verses uh, 5 and through 8. He said, For many shall come in my name. These are the words of Jesus, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He said, for nation shall rise against nations, 
Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? And kingdom against kingdoms. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in different or diverse places. And all of these are the beginning of sorrow. And then the 11th verse of Matthew 24. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And then the 32nd through the 34th verses. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. One more scripture while you're standing. Luke 21, 25, and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nation and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I believe they're happening right now. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. And you may be seated. Quite a lot of scriptures. But that's the way it is. If you were writing a newspaper describing our day, it would be just about like I read. You see, a lot of things are going on in our world. While our world is turbulent and a lot of uncertainty going on, not knowing what tomorrow may bring, there are nuclear arsenals all over the world. We don't think much about it, but India has nuclear power. Pakistan, a wild, fierce country has nuclear power. The Israel has nuclear power. And Russia and America. Just one little thing triggered it off. And we have a holocaust all over our world. And while this is going on, we keep on living. Strange. The Bible says in the last days, knowledge shall increase. We've got a lot of extremely intelligent people in this church, in this congregation. They've learned a lot. They've studied hard. And we have uh, students who pass with straight A's. I read about a girl in California. Her name was Karen Ching. She achieved a perfect score of 1,600. That's perfect. On uh, both sections of the Scholastic Achievement Test had a perfect 8,000 on the tough University of California acceptance index. Never in history has anyone accomplished this feat, which is almost staggering to uh, contemplate. Never been done at that time. She's a straight-A student at Mission, Mission San Jose High School, and she says, I'm just a typical teenager. I munch on junk food. I talk on the phone for hours, and she claims to be a procrastinator who doesn't do her work until the last minute. Her teachers have a different story. They call her Wonder Woman because her unquenchable thirst for knowledge and her uncanny ability uh, to retain that knowledge. She wants to be a lawyer or maybe a judge. She was accepted into Harvard. And she's waiting for a response from Stanford. Any prestigious institution would be honored to have this promising student. Sounds like she's got the world in her hands. So the world has been blessed with a brilliant, one-of-a-kind young lady who seems to likely to succeed in anything she decides to do. But the shocking national news story about Karen included a brief but Significant interchange with the reporter. He asked her, what is the meaning of life? 
And she said, I have no idea. I would like to know all of that without God. What a tragedy. This is the way our world is today. Give them a better education in our country, we'll be better. Give them more money and it'll make everybody happy. Not so. 1 Corinthians 1.21 tells us about this. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And that's why we stand behind this sacred pulpit and expound the word of God. That's what God shows. There are questions as individuals we need to ask ourselves. As a person, really, what am I and who am I? How did I get where I am? What really matters in life? Is somebody keeping score? And what does he expect of me? Is there life after death? How do I achieve eternal life if it exists? And what's the meaning of death? And we could put a lot of other questions. But we go to that wonderful old book called the Bible. And the mysteries of life begin to unfold as we read through its sacred pages. And we see what God did and how he did it. See what he wants, what his promises are. And guidance for every moment of every day we get from that wonderful book that God inspired. But end time is here. I don't think there's any real Christian that doubts that end time is here. Again, startling events are happening in our world. China is arming to the teeth. You see, the Bible predicts a massive war somewhere in the near future. They will amass 200 million soldier army. With that army, 2 billion people or one-third of the world's population will be killed in this cataclysmic war. Only one nation in history of the entire world could possibly fulfill this prophecy, and that is China. With one and two-tenths billion population. And the late Mao Zedong in his diary said, we could amass 200 million army. The sixth angel in, Gen in Revelation is going to sound, and when it does, that's where that army goes forth. In Revelation 9, 13 through 16, it says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar, the golden altar, which is before God. And 14, saying unto the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Verse 15. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And verse 16, please. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and that is 200 million. And I heard the number of them. Our world is heading toward greater trouble that we've ever seen. We hoped that elections would change, that men would come on the scene. But there is a prophecy in the Word of God that we will never get away from. And there is a war coming on this earth. Praise God, I don't think I'm going to be here. I don't plan on it. But let me say to you, if you're not rapture ready, you better get prepared. Dig yourself a storm shelter. It won't do you much good, but it'll give you comfort. Put lots of food and water in it. But I want to tell you, if you want to walk with Jesus, there is a rapture coming. He's going to take his bride home. And here is this big nation, China, rearming. Their economy has boomed.
for the year of 2020, they have predicted that China will lead the world in the economy. They held open war games just outside of Taiwan, and they claim they own Taiwan. It's a part of the original China, and Taiwan opened and cleared up their storm cellars and called an alert for all of their military while China was holding their, uh, their games. Hong Kong has gone back to Red China, one of the nations in the East, which was a hub of financial security. So lots of things are happening. And then, of course, Jesus focuses his word on the Jew and on Jerusalem. That's, say what you will, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. David made it that. It will always be that. God gave Jerusalem to the Jews. He gave Palestine to the Jews. Some of it they've been trying and have given away, but it's still in God's book. It belongs to the Jews. Read it in the 15th chapter of Genesis. So we don't know what's going to happen, but you remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 23 and 37. And he says, oh, Jerusalem. He's sitting outside. He's looking over. He's seeing the people as they rush up and down the busy streets, the commerce, the mothers with children, the men in the marketplace harking their wares. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets that I sent to you. He said, how often would I have gathered you as, a, as I gather my children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, but you would not. Verse 38, look at this. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. You could have had everything. Now you have nothing. Let me say to you here today, if you don't know Jesus, you can have everything, but without him you have nothing. Everything you own, every ambition that you ever aspire to will be like dust sifting through your fingers when Jesus comes. If you're not ready, it will not matter at all. Oh, what words. Oh, Jerusalem. Can you hear the heartbreak of God? Hear him as he pleads. I came, I tried. And you came to his own, and his own received him not. He said, seeing you have judged yourself unworthy of eternal life, as Paul spoke to the Jews, lo, I turned to the Gentiles to get a people for his namesake. The Oslo Accords were signed in, in, uh, on the White House lawn in September 1993, but they did not deal with the Jerusalem problem. It was put off. They gave the Palestinians Gaza and Jericho at that time. But you see, there are several things that we can know for sure about the future of Jerusalem. And they're specifically prophesied in the Bible. The Bible says there will be a Jewish temple. It will be built soon. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. And there was given me a rod. Read like a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. And then the next one, please. Verse 2, but the court which is without the temple, notice the word temple, they're in Jerusalem. There's a temple there. Leave it out and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. They will resume their animal sacrifices. Daniel 9, 27 prophesies that. The animal sacrifice will, re, will be resumed when the temple is completed, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, 
and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate under the consummation and that determined upon the desolates. Wow. I mean, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, that no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed the son of perdition. Next verse. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, so that is worship, so that he setteth. Notice, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Jews have trained men right now for the priesthood. They have recreated the vessels that go in the temple. They have men uh, already that they are training for the priesthood. They're constantly looking for that red heifer. They have to cook it, burn it into ashes. They take the ashes and mix it with water and pour it upon the men entering the priesthood for a cleansing. They cannot enter the priesthood until they get a red heifer with not one single white or any other color hair. How close are we when they're preparing for the temple and I just read to you that uh, it is going to happen just like that. And then there's the battle of Armageddon ahead, Revelation 16, 12. I know this is a lot of scripture, but I, I, I don't want to just say it. I want you to read it. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. This is that battle of Armageddon. And I saw three unclean spirits come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils. Notice who's in power here? Is the earth. Church is gone. Oh, Fred, this church has an impact on our world. It surely does. You take the church out of the world and God leaves it alone. The devil moves in. You talk about chaos, bloodshed, trouble, violence. It will be loose during that time. But God, he's got a church. He's, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world and to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Wow. Behold, I come as a thief in the night. You, can, you say, when's this rapture? Just like that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you bat your eyes, that quick the church is going to be gone. You won't even see them go. I come as a thief, and blesses he that watcheth, and keep with his garment, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Next one, please. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Folks, it's just ahead. Armageddon is just ahead. Tribulation is just ahead. I don't understand anybody that would not want to serve Jesus Christ. First of all, he's the one that gave his life for us. He loved us when we were bad, real bad. He's been patient with us. God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And then Zechariah 14, 2, 3, and 4. Then shall the Lord go forth. This is Armageddon. The Antichrist has brought his 200 million man army. They're camped against Jerusalem. They're going to wipe it out once and for all. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle like Joshua. Verse 4, please. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove 
toward the north and half of it toward the south. Next one, please. And his feet, uh, verse uh, 5. Oh, that's. And he shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto his zail. Yea, ye shall flee like you shall fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all his saints with thee. He's not coming in the rapture. He's coming in judgment. Revelation says this in our army of the saints of God. They're riding upon white horses. They got crowns on their head. No doubt a lot of this is symbolic, but let me tell you, Fred, whatever it is, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great if you are in that number. We used to sing the old song, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Oh, praise God. Yes, 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 yes. I'm Richmond. He's head of the Temple Institute in Israel. He said, regardless of whether the temple is built after the Messiah or before, he's going to be, we're going to have a Messiah that is a descendant of David. He's completely human, the greatest teacher that ever lived. He's going to put Jerusalem and Israel back together. That person will be our Messiah. Amen. You see, the Antichrist will be a man that will ascend in power, bringing peace. It's going to, he's going to have di diplomacy for the Middle East. He's going to solve a lot of problems. And when he does, he's going to win the Jews' confidence. And he is nothing but a devil disguised. He is the Antichrist. Once he gets in power, he will wield that power. Revelation 13, 11 and 12. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Next one, please. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This is the false prophet. He's pointing his attention toward the Antichrist. Daniel 8.25 talks about it. He said there, and through this policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many, and he shall also stand, but he shall be broken without hand. God alone is going to take care of him. The Antichrist is coming and it will be his destruction at the Battle of Armageddon when they bring those armies together. Revelation 9, 15 and 16. Here is the, and the four angels which were loose were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. And the next one, please. Uh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Revelation 13. And 16, and he causeth both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand. And, you know, I'm just going to ignore it. No, you won't. To receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads. And then the next one. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we know what that number is. Amen. 666. Revelation 13 and 7. And he was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And Daniel 7 23. And he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. These scriptures all fit with each other, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. This man is going to be a man of power. He is going to proclaim himself as God. He's going to number people. You see, they've got a chip now 
with a lithium battery that depends on the body temperature for recharge. The only place in the Bible that uh, does this, or rather the only place in the human body that changes is the hand and the forehead. And, of course, that's where this number is supposed to go. You say, I won't do it. Friend, if you don't have the courage to live for God, you don't have the gumption to separate from the world, trash sin, and give your life to Jesus, live a life of purity and separation. If you don't have the gumption to do it now, you sure won't do it when the church is gone. And nobody's praying for you. And God's not moving. The church is empty. Now is the day of salvation. You will take the mark of the beast. Yes, you will. They've got another microchip about the size of a human hair. Has three times the storage capacity. It's called Comatac chip. You have to pass a wand over it to read it. It's so unique that it can be picked up by satellites. A chip in your body. Yeah. Yeah. They'll know everything you are doing. You can't transfer it. Transfer it. The identification of that chip works at all times. And when the human body shuts down, it, it goes out. It shuts down after a few hours. There are satellites up there now that can read a postage stamp lying on a tennis court. They got Dozens and dozens of them up there. The whole world will be girded with satellite girds. They can pick up the difference between the temperature of a human body if it's up or down. <laughs> There's a voice translation system that you can speak into it with one language. It will broadcast 164 different languages and dialects. Yeah. Lockheed ran a full-page ad saying that we're reversing the Babel effect. That was the Tower of Babel. The European Common Market poster has the Tower of Babel on it. Many tongues, one voice, it says. See, the Bible's accurate. It is perfectly accurate and agrees with true science. It agrees with true, hist with true history. It, it is not imperfect. It doesn't have a lot of mistakes. The Bible is right. They picked up satellite images of chariot wheels in the Red Sea that fell off Pharaoh's chariots 3,500 years ago. Wow. With our world in such a mess, the church is what a, such a refuge. I read something I want to pass on to you. Heard a proponent of sex education schools confidently ask, does a teacher, dri does teaching driver's education, uh, does this decrease the incidence of accidents among young drivers? He said, this analogy caused me to wonder, what would happen if we trot Driver's ed, like they teach sex education. We'd say, welcome to driver's education 101. I'd like to go over some things that you can do for safe driving. While a majority of the drivers prefer driving on the right side of the road, some of you may choose to drive on the left side. This is a moral choice, and only you can decide. Does that sound familiar? You can only, only you can decide what's right, not your parents, not your friends. If you do decide to drive on the left side, use protection. Drive only automobiles that contain airbags. Airbags save lives. The same goes for red lights and stop signs. Some will tell you that you should terminate your acceleration at these designated areas. Again, this is another moral choice. 
I cannot tell you what's right or wrong. You have to decide whether this particular life choice is for you. But remember, education is the key when it comes to safety. Now, what would our roads be like if they taught driver ed like they teach sex education in school? What a farce. How did the devil ever get his foot so deep inside our education system? The church had to be asleep on that. So many of our kids are educated at home. Thank God for those wonderful parents who are able to do that. So the rapture is coming. The scripture said to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Thessalonians said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Voice of the archangel, the trump of God shall sound. Dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul said, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it's going to quicken you at his appearing. <laughs> We've got this wonderful message of the new birth of water and spirit. I'm going to tell you, folks, if you've got Jesus in your heart, hang on to him. Hang on to him. Walk with him. Deepen your life. And I read another story that I'd like to pass on. It just kind of depicts where we are. A man from Eugene, Washington, writes about his wife's grandfather. And he writes a story. He said, here I am, Pop. I'm back in the same country cemetery outside of Carlton, Oregon, where we said goodbyes 20 years ago. I remember service on that cool afternoon I remember how strange it was. The man who was born in the days of horse and buggies was brought to rest in a baby blue Cadillac hearse. I remember t returning to the city and writing a column about you where I worked in my newspaper. I wrote about how you were a vanishing breed, a man who held one job his entire life. You were a farmer a man who married the same woman and lived with her for 60 years, a man who died on the farm in the house where he'd been born 89 years earlier, a simple man who found meaning in tilling the earth below him and worshiping the God above him and loving the family around him, including the grand granddaughter that I married. But times have changed, Pops. After the column was published, lots of people wrote and called to say what a wonderful man you must have been and how they knew a pop of their own. But I'm afraid you wouldn't get the same warm reception were I to write the same column today. America is not the same country it was 20 years ago. Much has changed, Pops, too much. You're not going to understand this, but you'd be considered well politically incorrect these days. I remember a man who remained faithful to his wife, taught his children right from wrong, kept his family together despite drought and depression. But today, Pop, amid my baby boom generation, you'd be guilty of promoting family values. And that's something that Hugh Down said on television, fueled intolerance like Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan had. I remember a man who got tears in his eyes when singing Amazing Grace and the tiny church you helped found in Carlton. But today, Pop, you'd be considered a fool for worshiping some obsolete God when you should be searching for your inner child or winning by intimidation or awakening the warrior spirit which was within you. I remember a man who made his grandchildren wind chimes for Christmas and helped other families bale their hay when a storm was coming. I remember a man who insisted that we all hold hands before a meal 
and when he'd finished praying, would give their hands to one they hold the hand and encourage and squeeze. But today, Pop, you'd be cast as a cultural villain, a white U European male who wears fur-lined cap and eats meatloaf. The country's changed in the last 20 years since you died, and so some of it has been better. If not overcoming our prejudice, we're at least confronting some of them, and especially against women and minorities, and recycling has caught on, and the big hunk Folks finally made a wrapper that doesn't stick to the candy bar. What's going on, Pops? Grade school killings, crack cocaine, drive-by shootings, trashy talk shows, posh partial birth abortions, computer pornography, runaway lawsuits. This is my country that I love very much, but this is all true. Shock radio, sexual abuse, grandparents who have to raise their grandchildren because their sons and daughters are on drugs. And all this has mushroomed in the last 20 years. Your great daughter and granddaughter needed notes from their parents to get their ears pierced. But they could legally have an abortion without their parents' permission. Schools enthusiastically pass out condoms, but they ban children from handing out Christmas cards. Crazy, isn't it? We're losing trust. All sorts of walls have been built between groups of people the vicious anti-Christian remarks that are made, they would make fun of Christians, Christians like you, Pop. They are routinely mocked. What we've lost in this country, Pop, is trust. We don't trust each other. We don't trust our government. We don't trust God. What we trust in, Pops, is ourself, in which you once said, is a little like standing beneath a lone tree in a field during a lightning storm. Graham Young once told me the story about the foolish, toothless old man who showed up asking you for free hay, and you gladly obliged. She said only to find out later that the man had money to pay, and the two farmers down the road paid for their hay. You trusted people too much, but today trust is the rarest of virtue, mirrored in broken promises of spouses and politicians. And even the head of the United Way was convicted of embezzling from the charity he directed. Today, people demand rights and ignore responsibility in the land of the free. Millions of Americans live in prison in the home of the brave. Men who exude great public courage are routinely uncovered as like a Wizard of Oz, all style but no substance. The same baby boom generation that so fervently clamored for peace in the 60s is filled with people who you can't find peace and with the person they once chose to spend a lifetime with. Dashing Hollywood actors promote noble causes then get caught seeking sex in some red light district. Still, even when the public is light, this light is shined on them, people rarely humble themselves and admit their mistakes. AIDS have increased. Our nation has been cursed with AIDS, but people still play around with sex as if it was cheap, a harmless toy. We become like a bunch of Herefords caught in quicksand, and the harder we struggle on our own, the deeper we sink. A world gone astray. That's my subject today. A world gone astray. So where do we go? What do we say? What do we do? There's only one place. It's not the governor. It's not the mayor. It's not the president. It's not the educator. If you don't know Jesus, 
best thing you could ever do is find somebody who knows him and let them open that book to you and open a brand new life. <laughs> Isaiah 13 and 13 through 16. I need to read these. Though now God is speaking 700 years before the cross. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. It's not just going to be among people. The very earth and heavens are going to be affected. It shall be as the chaste roe. He's talking about the earth. This earth is going to be as a chaste row. Remember, it's tipped 23 and a half degrees. It's spending 1,000 miles an hour, and every 365 days, it's going around the sun. That deer covers an area of approximately 10 miles. It stays within that unless you shoot at it or you scare it. It'll jump the same fence approximately the same time every evening. But scare it or wound it, and it's gone, and it may go to any country anywhere. And God said that day, the earth is not going to do this. It is going to be like a chaste roe, or as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one to his own land. Next one, next verse. And every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Doesn't sound good, does it? Their children shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. We preach to you a positive gospel that Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heaven laden. We talk to you about the opportunities because of Calvary and blood that was shed. That's the top side, friend. But the flip side is what we're reading right now. When the church is gone, this is what's going to happen to the world. Isaiah 2, 19 and 21. <clears throat> and they shall go into the holes. Troubles on, tribulations on, holes of the rocks into the caves of the earth. What for? For the fear of the Lord. God is going to bring judgment. And for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Next one. And in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver, his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship. Notice where they are, to the moles and the bats, they're in caves trying to hide from God. Next one, please. I guess that was it. And they go into the clefts of the rock. He's going to shake this earth terribly. I have a lot of scriptures today. I don't apologize because it's the word of God. And we need to hear it. I'm not a negative preacher. But, folks, we need to know what's going to happen to this world. First of all, you'll never live for God if you're scared of the Antichrist. But it ought to wake you up to know that God is a loving God, a compassionate God. But someday he's going to lay aside his love and his compassion. And God is going to pick up his gavel of judgments. You, you're going to need a Savior. Would you stand with me, please? You're going to need a Savior. We all need one. You see, leadership in this earth teaches us to be independent. Stand on your own feet. And as an individual serving God, that's what we need to do. But if you're going to take care of yourself in the future, you're going to need a Savior to help you. There's only so much you can do. And even if you could get to heaven without the wedding garment on, the Bible tells us that you wouldn't get in without that wedding garment. We worship the babe in the manger. We worship the risen Christ. We worship the power of the one who sends forth 
his presence and his blessing, his cleansing power. We baptize in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. Sins are not remitted until you are baptized in Jesus' name. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I say. Amen. And you're not totally born again until you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You have died, you've been buried, but it's time to get resurrected. And that's the Holy Ghost. I don't like to think of, and I'm certainly not uh, unpatriotic, I don't like to think of the shape uh, my country is in. I've been in a lot of different countries. I wouldn't trade citizenship in America or any place in this world. But it's full of sin. It's full of sin. If for nothing else, God would judge America for the millions of babies that God gave life to. John said he is the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. God gave life to and they snuffed it out with their hands. America will pay a horrible penalty for that. Maybe some of it while the church is here. He didn't say we weren't going to have tribulations. He said in this world you will have tribulation. But you gear up. You get on the arm of God. You get the spirit of God vibrant in your life. You hide the word of God in your heart. And go through every problem, every trial, every test, every temptation. And come out shining and ready when he comes again. Would you like to come and pray? Let's talk to him. Let's talk to Jesus.